Hello, today we're with Mr. Jack Needenthal, who is a former Peace Corps volunteer, um, liaison for the government of the Marshall Islands, and movie and filmmaker and movie director. Thank you for being here today. You're welcome. So today, we were just going to ask you a few questions regarding your movies and also about the Marshall Islands. Okay. So our first question is Peace Corps. Why the Marshall Islands? Um, actually, when I originally applied to be a Peace Corps volunteer, I also applied to grad school to go to Penn State, which thrilled my parents because they were from Pennsylvania. And I had also applied to the Peace Corps and had forgotten about mm -hmm. it. I wanted to go to Nepal like everybody else uh, back then. And I got the, the word that Peace Corps had accepted me and that I'd be assigned to the Marshall Islands. And the first thing I did is I looked in the Caribbean Sea to try to figure out where the Marshall Islands were, which is close to Florida. And I realized that they weren't there and that they were in the Pacific. And the other thing that really intrigued me after five years of college was they said I'd be assigned to an outer island in the Marshall mm -hmm. Islands and that the two biggest problems, and then in capital letters, it said isolation and boredom. And I thought, wow, that sounded really good. <laughs> and so I decided I would do that. And I told my parents I'd be back in two years. So 32 years later, I'm still out there. But um, I, I thought I made a really good choice. I really uh, enjoyed being out there. So after your term as a Peace Corps, you end up working for the government of the Marshall Islands. Can you tell us a little bit about how that evolved? Well, actually, I, you could call it the government of the Marshall Islands, but the government I actually work for is the people of Bikini Atoll, mm -hmm. their local government. And what happened was I had been on an outer island in the Marshalls called Namu. At that time, there were no airports. It was very isolated. We get a boat about every five months. So. In order for me to even get a sign there um, among our 11 volunteers, you had to be one of the best language speakers. So I worked really hard at it because I wanted to go to a place that was very isolated. It just kind of intrigued me. Um, I tend to like to do the things that are more difficult and more challenging. So I, um, I, I worked really hard at the language. I got put out there in the middle of nowhere. And because I was out there for so long, three years, I actually asked for an extra year. Um, after my first year of Peace Corps, out of the 11 people, eight had quit. Mm -hmm. And so there was just three of us left, and I was just like, well, I'm just going to have fun. And that second year, I did have a lot of fun, so I asked for a third year. And after those three years of being out there, I learned the language well and the culture well. I really loved the place, and I thought that, you know, I could do this for a long time. but. Three years was a long time to be on the Outer Islands, so I was just about to get ready to leave. I was going to go back to graduate school at Penn State, and some Bikinians heard me speaking Marshallese in a restaurant. Mm -hmm. And they had just gotten a $20 million trust fund, and they had a lot of issues with the U.S. government. They were talking about possibly moving to Maui en masse, all the people. So they needed somebody to work with their local government, teach in their school, teach the adults English, to kind of get them ready for this move to Maui, which never really happened. So I thought, okay, one more year on the Outer Islands, which is a long time. Um, if you've ever lived on an Outer Island, it's, mm -hmm. it's, it's not an easy life. Uh, I decided, okay, one more year, and that turned into two more years. So I wound up being three years on Kili with the people of Bikini. And then the person who had my job before me passed away. He got brain cancer, and his name was Ralph Waltz. He was a good friend of mine. He, when he passed away, um, the mayor, Tamaki Judah, came to me and just said, go do what Ralph was doing. Um, that was my only instruction, which was pretty scary. All the filing cabinets were locked. There were no disks for the computers. I had to figure out everything I was supposed to be doing. Um, but that was in 1986, so I don't know how many years that is. Um, maybe 27 years ago mm -hmm. I started doing this job. But that's how it came to be. Describe your relationship with the people of Bikini. Um, the only way I can describe that is if you understand Marshallese culture, when you, my wife's a Bikini and mm -hmm. we have five children and soon to be two grandchildren. Um, when you get married to a Marshallese, they consider you become one person. Mm -hmm. And the Bikinians consider me a Bikinian. Mm -hmm. So that's sort of the way I consider myself at this point. And um, so it's a very close relationship, just like you would. 
you know, the, the thing about the Pacific Islands and Micronesia, family is extremely important and it makes for some really good values, but you know, when you have family, close family, there's always family problems and issues and situations. So you're, you know, you're always, you know, really deep into that most of, most of the time. But uh, I've grown to really enjoy it, and I've had incredibly harsh arguments with people from our own community. But when you have really bad arguments or big disagreements with even your your boss or your local government officials or whatever. It's all under the, with the understanding that you're family. They know they can say anything they want to me, and I can say anything back, and I'm not going to get fired or get chastised, or they know I'm not going to run away and quit. Mm -hmm. So it makes for a really good relationship. Uh, like a family, you know, you have those kind of arguments and situations within your family disagreements. So it, it's been a sometimes really intense sort of situations um, that I've, uh, I've been in, but um, it's very gratifying also because you're working for people who are, have been disadvantaged and have all kinds of problems because of the nuclear weapons testing, mm -hmm. so it's always very gratifying. And is your relationship with the Bikinians uh, um, what transitioned you to create Marshallese film? Um, you have to, if you understood my job, I'm the trust liaison for the people of Bikini. It's this immensely stressful job. You just can't imagine. I mean, um, we have this whole slew of professional people who work for us. Trustees, money managers, lawyers, engineers, all these scientists. Mm -hmm. You have the media constantly doing the bikini story. I do all their accounting. They they have, I've, I think, uh, I've totaled up last year since I started the job I've written 172,000 checks mm -hmm. um, so I do all their accounting um, I deal with the US government that's a huge part of my job so it's extremely stressful all the time mm -hmm. I'm a like heavy bureaucrat and every day from I'm like a doctor it's it's 365 days a year 24 mm -hmm. 7 no matter where I am my phone could ring with somebody having a problem so I'm in that kind of environment all the time and it's a very stressful sort of a bureaucratic thing. Mm -hmm. And I've always felt like I'm an artistic person. I've always been very creative. I've been writing all my life. If you looked in my bookshelf, my office, you know, people have only seen these four or five stories I put to film. I have racks of novels and stories and screenplays. Mm -hmm. I mean, I could, you know, maybe I could do this for the rest of my life just making films of the stories I've already done. So I wanted to snap out of that stressful, heavy, bureaucratic sort of environment and become more of what I really feel mm -hmm. I am. If you had to ask me, what am I? I'm a, I'm a filmmaker. I'm an artist. That's what I want to be known as or remembered as. And so this really helped me do that. And with the technology available today, you couldn't do what I'm doing now, even probably mm -hmm. 10 or 15 years ago. You just, you'd have to have a big Hollywood studio or raise money and everything else to make a film, but now all you need is a camera and mm -hmm. your thumb to push the red button with. Um, it's really amazing what you can do now with the technology available. So that's kind of what moved me into that direction. I just wanted to become more of myself after all these years of mm -hmm. sitting behind a desk and doing bureaucratic things. Mm. How do you feel um, about Ambassador Tom Armbruster's statement that the nuclear test compensation has been paid in full? Um, that's basically the U.S. view, and mm -hmm. he's a U.S. ambassador, and I know Tom pretty well. His wife's actually in my new film, um, but um, he, that, that's the U.S. stance. You have to understand that um, it's this big, long, sort of sordid history of what's happened in the Marshall Islands, but basically in, in the early 1980s, the Bikinians were given a compensation package in the first compact. The Bikinians voted 85% against mm -hmm. that compact because they had a great lawsuit against the U.S. The U.S. had tried two or three times to throw that case out of court, and they couldn't do it because at the time of the testing, the Bikinians were basically trust territory or U.S. citizens mm -hmm. with Fifth Amendment constitutional rights under the U.S. Constitution. So they couldn't get this case out of court, so the only way they could do it was to make a big, giant deal with the, the RMI government as a whole and say, look, we'll give you this billion-dollar package but the deal is you espouse or get rid of all these cases that are in the mm -hmm. U.S. courts, again, for the nuclear testing. This is the full and final settlement. 
And what they did is they turned all the nuclear atolls into this tiny minority voting bloc, mm -hmm. the four atolls that were affected, and had all the rest of the Marshall Islands vote against them, basically, to get mm -hmm. this big giant package from the U.S. that gave them the ability to come here without visas and work and go to school. You know, to the rest of the Marshallese population, it looked like a great deal. But for the nuclear victims, it was awful. Mm -hmm. And that's why even though we had, we were going to get $75 million under that first compact, the Bikinians voted against it. They didn't want it. They wanted their lawsuit in the courts. So basically, we got this, this money under that first compact. It wasn't enough to bikini, clean bikini. Later, they gave $90 million more to clean bikini, with which wasn't nearly enough. Mm -hmm. It's only enough for us to survive off of the interest um, to take care of our people where they are now. So it's not enough to clean bikini. And we still felt like we were owed more money. So we tried under the Nuclear Claims Tribunal that was mm -hmm. set up under the first compact, we filed a suit there. The U.S. government gave that tribunal $42 million. Well, our lawsuit alone, the settlement was $560 million in 2001. Mm -hmm. And we got zero so far. And if you add in Rongelap and the other atolls, it's like over $2 billion worth of claims and there's no money left. So we went back to the U.S. courts and said, look, you set this thing up. It's really bogus. We're owed all this money. How come we can't get it? Um, we feel like we deserve it. And it went all the way up to the U.S. Supreme Court and mm -hmm. finally they said, look, this is a treaty between the Marshall Islands and the U.S. government. We're not in the job of breaking treaties. So therefore, this lawsuit mm -hmm. can't be seen in the U.S. courts. Mm -hmm. And that was sort of the deal under the first compact. They said, this is the full and final settlement. No Marshallese citizen can go to the U.S. courts and sue the U.S. over mm -hmm. anything that happened in the nuclear testing era. So the Supreme Court agreed with that. Mm -hmm. So now we're like stuck. I, I like to, I liken it to we're, we're stuck with taking our tin cup and going back and banging it in front of Congress saying we need this and we need that, but they're not obligated to give us anything mm -hmm. legally. Morally, I think they are. And some of those people back there in Washington do recognize there is a moral obligation and they continue to be very supportive of us on a certain level, but not nearly to the level we need in terms of compensation mm -hmm. to clean bikini. So that statement by the ambassador is basically a true statement, and it's mm -hmm. the U.S. view of things, that this thing's all done. And um, they've got their trust funds and whatever they want to do with them, that's mm -hmm. up to them, and, you know, that's it. But we still view that, the uh, Bikini and community and the Marshall Islands government, we view that as very unfair. Mm -hmm. It was like, uh, it was almost like uh, when um, Charlie Brown goes to kick the football and Lucy moves the football out of the way, mm -hmm. and there's no more football there. I mean, they, they just kind of... It was like a bait and switch, and we feel that that wasn't very genuine of them mm -hmm. to do that. The Pacific is going through a lot of environmental challenges. Is global warming, such as sea level rise, also affecting the Marshall Islands, in particular the people of Bikini as well? Well, you don't have to necessarily be from Bikini to be affected at this point. Everybody in the Marshall mm -hmm. Islands, I look, at a high tide, we're this far above sea level. Mm -hmm. And the Marshall Islands, unlike a lot of you places, even in Micronesia, they're all flat as pancakes. Mm -hmm. And we have certain tides during the year where I've noticed over the years that it keeps getting more. There's, for example, at the end of the island in, in Laura or in, in Majuro, there are trees there that they're huge. They look like they're 100-year-old they're trees, mm -hmm. and they're just like washing out into the lagoon. So you know things are happening. Mm -hmm. There's a graveyard downtown that's been there for a long time, and you can go there, and you can actually see the gravestones on the reef now. Mm. Um, our new film that we're doing involves um, rising sea levels. Mm -hmm. And um, I've kind of worked that into a creative story. And I'm doing that because I feel like there's politicians rounding the earth now from not just the Marshall Islands, but Micronesia, and we're all screaming, mm -hmm. hey, there's a big issue here. Um, I see it almost, unfortunately, I see it almost as hopeless because it's not like you can go to the Chinese or the India, mm -hmm. India or the U.S. where there's just, you know, literally billions of people driving cars and going, you can't say, okay, turn all that stuff off. Well, we have a problem here, we're going to be taken over by rising sea levels. Mm -hmm. People are not going to just change their habits. I think the best thing that we can do is just to 
show people what we're going to lose mm -hmm. and make sure that someday when my children have um, their children and, and, and their grandchildren, they can at least see what this place once looked like. Because I see it, unfortunately, I almost see it as inevitable. It's, it's the rest of the world is not going to suddenly mm -hmm. change their habits because you know, a few thousand people in Micronesia are going under. It's, it's not something I, it's very hard for me to say that. I think it's disgusting, but to me it's, it's a reality that I, I just don't know how you get around mm -hmm. it. I don't know how you change the rest of the world the, the way they think. And that's why in this new film, it's almost like a, a global warming fantasy. Mm -hmm. I have a little 10-year-old girl who basically does that. She changes the way the rest of the world mm. thinks. So it's almost like uh, me saying, this is the way I wish it could be. So. so what are some of your challenges as a filmmaker? Um, the, the challenges of a filmmaker in, in the Marshall Islands are like, I'm sure, nowhere else on Earth. I mean, it's... It's just constant things like we film. There's not too many places where you have to check the tide table mm -hmm. before you film. I always film at low tide. It doesn't matter where you are in that atoll. If you're filming at high tide, it sounds like you know, you're in an earthquake because mm -hmm. you can hear the waves no matter where. You know, the islands, my house is at a place where it's really wide and it's maybe 100 yards. I mean, it's not mm -hmm. that wide. So you can always hear the ocean on both sides. So we're always filming at low tide, which is kind of weird. And um, there's dog issues and, you know, dogs barking. Like we're filming at my house now and we've got six dogs. So we're constantly telling dogs to shut up and stuff. But, um, and because of the way we do our films, our actors, we pay them a little at the end if we make money mm -hmm. on the film. But they're all volunteers. So you're try constantly trying to get people to arrange their schedules to drive 20 miles out to my house at this point to film there or go to town if they live out of town. Mm -hmm. So because we're not paying them, it's kind of hard to say, you know, you have to come. Yeah. I mean, they're volunteers. It's like, please come. Um, so we're constantly begging people to be around. And Suzanne, who helps me with the films, has little kids. So she's always, and she works at a newspaper, so she's got scheduling mm -hmm. issues all the time. Um, there's wind. There's, you know, we're, I've lost my little window from... July to about now where it's just dead calm. Um, we're moving into that time where it starts to rain a little bit and the wind mm -hmm. starts coming. And once the wind starts coming, it's like constantly figuring out how to film without the wind mm -hmm. hitting the microphone. It, it's just really intense. And of course, um, nowadays people understand what films are, but before when I used to be making a film, um, you'd have kids jumping in the shot, you know, kids coming around to watch. Mm -hmm. um, not understanding, I have to be quiet, and you know, just crazy things like that. But uh, it's very challenging, and people don't understand that when they watch. The, I, I look at each film that I've done as like a miracle. I can't believe I did this because every time I start doing a new one, all these issues rise again. It's like, how did I ever finish that last one? I just, mm -hmm. yeah, it's crazy. And the other big issue I have is um, I do most of the stuff myself. I mean, I'm camera. I'm sound, I'm lighting, um, I do a lot of the casting, mm -hmm. uh, I do a lot of the begging for people to come. Suzanne helps me co-direct, she helps me co-produce, but most of the burden is on me to, and I write the stories, and so I do almost everything, and mm -hmm. that's, you know, I'm 55, so for me, that's like, I get to the end of the day, and it's like I've been hit by a bus. And it doesn't matter how little I did because, you, mm -hmm. you know, when you go setting all these things up, it's, a, it's me doing everything. So it's, um, you know, feeding people and everything like that. So it's a really intense sort of thing to do. And even at my age, as I get older, I keep thinking, okay, how many more times can I do this before I just collapse? Um, so I know I'm up against a time constraint. Mm -hmm. I have a lot of stories I want to tell. So I'm constant. I'm never. I never stop filming. I'm always pushing the red button and filming something. So I feel like I'm like I have this little block of time I have mm -hmm. to do this before I have to stop. So you were talking about how a lot of your cast is volunteers. How do you end up casting them? The first film we did, which was a big experiment, um, if you watch it, you can see all the technical flaws and the editing flaws and everything else. Um, it was a children's film. 
Um, I'd never made a film before. I wanted kids to have screen time, so I didn't edit it very ruthlessly. I let kids, you know, spend a lot of time on the screen. I wanted them, part of what I'm doing is I want to show these kids that their lives, too, are worthy of exploration mm -hmm. and film. I want them to see themselves on the screen. So we go out and we do that, and um, sorry, I forgot the question. How do you cast Oh, your... cast. So we go out and we, that first film we had auditions, and that worked out pretty well. But then I decided that, you know, we know almost everybody in town. I know all, a, lot, a lot of these, like in the film we're doing now uh, that's showing at the, the Hawaiian International Film Festival, Zori, two of the three people in the film are Bikinians, but it's my niece and my nephew. Mm -hmm. So it's sort of like, get in the car, we're going to make a movie. Um, but uh, a lot of the people are people we know. We know their personalities. You know, Marshallese in a general way are very shy, and not everybody's an actor anyway. So you have to find people who you think would be coachable mm -hmm. and are more outgoing and... Um, because as a filmmaker, if you're doing a lot of this stuff on your own like mm -hmm. I am, you want people who can do things quick and mm -hmm. fast. Like the little girl in our film now is just like the most amazing actress I've ever seen in my life, and she's like 10. Um, she just nails it every time. That's why I love her. It's like you don't have to spend a lot of time doing mm -hmm. a lot of takes. So you try to find people who can get the job quickly, done quickly, and, and in a nice way. You know, they have to be very convincing. The, the way we do our films, you know, we don't have a lot of CGI. Mm -hmm. I'm not the greatest editor in the world. So you have to have people who can convey emotions the right way in a very convincing way. So um, that's what you're seeing on the screen mm -hmm. in our films, like people, just people, not a lot of other effects or anything. So you have to have people who are very convincing. And um, Suzanne and I, like I said, pretty much know everybody. So we think, oh, who could do this character? Who could do that character? And, First we ask them, and then mm -hmm. we tell them they're going to be in the movie. Mm. Um, we're pretty good at that. There's very, very few people who have ever said no to us after we worked on them for a while. <laughs> but um, it, it's, it's a little bit of a process. I guess additions would help. I think people would love it if we would mm -hmm. do additions, because there's lots of people out there now that would love to be in a movie. Mm -hmm. um, it's become quite popular. But uh, we just like dealing with people we know. It just makes it easier. Your last movie, The Sound of Crickets at Night, uh, that was critically acclaimed. Right. Um, but there have been some criticisms around it. How do you feel about that? Um, well, there's different ways to look at it. As an artist, when somebody criticizes my work, I just think, well, they didn't look at it hard enough. Mm -hmm. They don't understand what it was about. Um, and, and sometimes when people do look at that particular film, there are a lot of areas... Um, well, just to be personal, I mean, the, my character. Mm -hmm. um, some people say, well, why would you have a Marshallese god come back as an American with a beard and long hair or whatever? Mm -hmm. And I just thought that that would be a nice hook showing the power, how powerful this god mm -hmm. really was, and that he was able to do that. And because the American history is sort of so, so tied into what happened to mm -hmm. the Bikinians, I thought it might be neat to have a... Uh, an American character called George Bush come mm -hmm. back as uh, as that particular person. And some people didn't like that, but um, nowhere in the film does it say this guy's an American. Mm -hmm. And so I defend that by saying, well, he was an American. He was actually a Marshallese that looked like an American. Mm -hmm. And, you know, in the end, what does a Marshallese look like? You know, they're all different colors, shapes, and sizes. So, it, so you know, those kind of criticisms, it's part of as an artist, when you put something out there, you have to expect that. Mm -hmm. Not everybody likes everything. And everybody, I, when I watch films, I'm really critical of what, mm -hmm. what I see. Is that believable? Um, does that make any sense? The story doesn't work. The camera work. You know, you get very critical about things, and you have to be able to um, accept that and mm -hmm. deal and not worry about it and understand that people, some people aren't going to like your film. Um, but I, I really like that film personally because um, the, p the person that played the other half of the god was mm -hmm. actually at the time the mayor of Bikini, Allison Kalin, and my boss. And he and I are very close friends. That guy never says no to anything I ever ask him to do. And, of course, I never say no to him either. But um, it was just a really nice film. I had a, 
you know, my wife's uncles in that film, the two little girls in that film um, are Bikinians, and the mm -hmm. one girl won a, a, a grand jury award for acting at the age of 10 at the Guam Film Festival in 2012. So we really felt like that film was a turning point for mm -hmm. us. I had better equipment in that film. I was able to shoot in high definition, believe it or not, for the first time. The other films weren't shot that way. So um, I, I understand there's criticism, but that's part of the game, and mm -hmm. you just have to accept. It. You got to keep, you know, keep plodding on and just keep hoping someday everybody will like what you do. But I don't think that ever happens. And so your new film, Zori, is coming out in the International Film Festival this right. week and yeah. next week. Yeah. How do you feel about that? Um, I am really amazed. Zori is a film, it stars my little nephew, Maxter, who's actually here with, with us on this trip. He'd never been to Honolulu before, so I'm sure he's in the swimming pool right now. Mm -hmm. um, I made that film because I knew there was no way I could have a feature film done in time for like the, I like the Guam International mm -hmm. Film Festival in Hawaii here. And so I decided I'd make a really simple story. This, the story of this, this film is so simple. It's about a little kid who loses a Zori. I mean, how simple mm -hmm. can you get? But it's also about the relationship between a grandparent, a, a grandmother and her grandson. Mm -hmm. And to me in the Pacific, that's an enormously important relationship, unlike anywhere else in the world, is the relationship between a grandparent and a grandchild. Because I'm a grandfather now, and I know what that feels like. Mm -hmm. And I know it's, it's different in the Pacific. It's, mm -hmm. it's very, very meaningful relationships. So I decided I would do, I just want to do a little short film, see if I could do in nine minutes to, to tug on that sort of relationship and emotion that you have between these two people. And um, so it's a very simple, straightforward film. I was shocked. I wasn't shocked when it went to Guam because those people really like our films there. It's Micronesia, and it's a very Micronesian film, um, like all of my films are. But this one's really, you know, it's, it's a really Micronesian film. Mm -hmm. And so we went there, and I was stunned. It's only a nine-minute film, and in Guam they had a film that was in Sundance. They had a... a filmmaker there who won the Palme d'Or and uh, Cannes, the first Filipino ever to do that. He had a film there, a feature film. He had all these really good films. The like Guam's been getting really uh, good in their recruiting of films for their festival. Mm -hmm. I was stunned on the last day when they announced that Zori won the Audience Choice Award. It was like, this is a nine minute film among all these big giant films and people voted for this. Mm -hmm. I mean, it was really quite thrilling. And then the idea that it gets into the Hawaii International Film Festival. Anderson Lee, the, the guy who programs, um, he saw me when, our, when The Sound of Crickets at Night was in Los Angeles. He came up to me and said, wow, I really like your films. Anything you have, send it to me. Mm -hmm. Which is like a, wow. <laughs> I mean, that really made me feel good. That's a big deal. So I thought, oh, I'll send him Zori. I don't know if this is... You know, it's it's not a really complicated film. There's no CGI. It's mm -hmm. just an old woman and a little kid. You know, who's going to want to watch this? I don't think it's good enough for Hawaii, but I submitted it anyway. So I was thrilled the day. I know he's on my, he's a Facebook friend, so mm -hmm. and he has a way of telling people what he does almost every day. And he was in a cafe here in Hawaii, and he says, oh, I've got to watch all these short films today for the festival and decide which ones get in. Uh, this is a real hassle. You know, he's kind of complaining mm -hmm. about it. About an hour later, I get an email, and he says, Jack, I love Zori. It's definitely going to be in HIF. And this is back in June. I mean, mm -hmm. I didn't even find out The Sound of Crickets at Night was going to be in until, like, August or something. So I, I was pretty happy that this little short film got such quick recognition, and it's, uh, it's a real tribute to the little boy who's in the film. He mm -hmm. really blows people away. He's a really cute kid. Um, he was... Uh, Grew up in our house. His parents were living us when he was born. He was born two months premature. Mm -hmm. One leg's longer than the other, so he's, he walks kind of funny. And he teetered between life and death for two months. My wife and I and his parents were in the hospital almost mm -hmm. every day with this kid. So he's really special to me and to us. But he has this way. I don't know if, if it's because the start of his life was so mm -hmm. traumatic or what, but when he looks at you and smiles at you and talks to you, it's just like... 
you want to watch. Mm -hmm. So that's why I decided when I, I wrote the film kind of with him in mind, I thought this is something, he's been in all our films in one form or another, little P, he's always around, so he's always in something, um, what we do. But so I, I'd like to feature him in a film and it was like, I didn't realize how powerful of an actor this little kid was until I started editing. It was like, geez, man, this is gonna, I think this could blow people away, but maybe not. You know, you think mm -hmm. about everything you do like that, but I was really happy with how that turned out. So out of all of your accomplishments, how would you like the world to remember you? Oh, wow. Um, I'd like the world to remember me as Vivian's father. No. Um, <laughs> um, I don't know. I, you know, you, I don't think about it that much, but um, I'd like people to remember me as somebody who, not as Jack the American guy or whatever. I'd like to, people to remember me as just somebody who was always trying to make things better. Um, the filmmaking, you know, you, I always say to people, imagine growing up your whole life, never seeing a, a film in your own language, mm -hmm. set in your own country, dealing with culture, uh, issues unique to your own culture. I, I, f I feel like I helped fill that void. Now my kids and my grandkids can watch a film in their own language, you know, it's set in the Marshall Islands. I feel like I've done something there. And you know, my time in the Marshall Islands, I've always, I've rarely said no to anybody. I mean, I was chairman of the Board of Social Security System for 12 years as an outsider. That's pretty unusual for that to happen. Mm -hmm. I felt that, like that was a great honor that they chose me. I worked for a long time as a regent at the college. We helped get the college off show cause. So, um, you know, I've been president of the Madra Cooperative School now for five years. We started a high school. You know, there wasn't a high school there before, uh, uh, accredited high school that wasn't religious. So that's, we build a high school. So, you know, I mean, it's, um, I've been part of uh, bigger groups of people that have done some pretty astounding things in the Marshall Islands. And I just hope people, when they remember me, it's like, oh yeah, that guy had his sleeves rolled up and he was always trying to do his best or whatever. Um, that, would, that would be good. Well, I want to thank you for the time that you've given us. Uh, and we are looking forward to your other films coming okay. out and everyone go watch Sorry. Yeah, well, thank you. <laughs> thank <Thanks>. you. Yeah. <laughs>